And we're using the AI next to it, right? The companion. Okay. Shalom, everyone. Happy spring. Unless you live in Maine, then you've got snow. And I guess they got snow up in a lot of places up north. But anyway, no snow here. So Santa Claus will have to wait. I'm going to try to cover something that I found fascinating. And that's why I decided for a couple of weeks we're going to do something that I, I find interesting. And so I'm going to talk to you about the Nephilim, which some translate as simply as giants. Now, the book that I'm using for my guide is called First Enoch. And right now I like George W.E. Nicholsburg and James C. Vanderkam the best because of some of their, their highlights and their notes that are in it. But I want to read to you the first, the introduction, because I think it'll give you an understanding of why it's important to learn this one. It begins by saying the words of the blessings with which Enoch blessed the righteous chosen who will be present on the day of tribulation to remove all the enemies and the righteous will be saved. Did you hear that? Those blessed righteous ones, those chosen ones who will be here during the tribulation. Misses the idea of rapture in here. And he took up his as discourse and he said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, who had a vision of the Holy One of the heavens, with which he showed me from the words of the watchers and the Holy Ones, I heard everything. And I, and I heard everything from them. I also understood what I saw. Not for the, this generation do I expound. Not for this generation do I expound. But this is concerning the distant times that I'm speaking to. The great Holy One will come forth from his dwelling, and the Eternal One will tread upon thence upon Mount Sinai. He will appear with his army, and he will appear with his mighty host of the heavens of heavens. And all the watchers will fear and quake, and those who are hiding in all the ends of the earth will sing, and all the ends of the earth will be shaken, and the trembling and the great fear will seize them, and the watchers unto the ends of the earth, the high mountains will be shaken, and fall and break apart, and the high hills will be made low, and melt like wax before the fire. The earth will be wholly rent asunder. Everything on the earth will perish. And there will be judgment on all. And the righteous he will make peace. And over the chosen there will be protection. And upon them will be mercy. They will all be all, they will all be gods. And he will grant them his good pleasure. He will bless them all. And he will help them all. Light will shine upon them. And he will make peace with them. Look, he comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to destroy all the wicked and to convict all humanity for the wicked deeds that they have done and the proud and the hard words that wicked sinners spoke against him. Our story tonight, I guess, is a continuation of Daniel. And I say that because what drew me to the book of Enoch was the understanding of what's called watchers. You see, in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about watchers. And I'd always read over that word. I'd never seen it before. In fact, let, let me read it to you. It's, it, it comes from Daniel 4.13. I saw the visions of my head while on my bed. And there was ire, or or depending on how you pronounce the, the vowels, or a watcher and a holy one coming down from the heavens. So the watcher and the holy one are two different people, and both were coming down. 
So I've, I, you can find him again in 417 and 423 because they, he uses the word again over and over again. And remember, when I was teaching you, Daniel, the one thing that I wanted to point out was that this was the probably one of the very first Apocrypha books, books that were dealing with not the days of, of Ezekiel, but all the way to the end of days. That's what it was working on. And so I wanted to understand more about it. Now, in Irim, which is a group called angels or called watchers, is an Aramaic word. The book of Enoch was written in Aramaic. Now, much of the, of Enoch was lost. In fact, there's going to be a period of time of almost several hundred years between basically the 400s and the early, uh, well, late to middle 1800s. There will be no book of Enoch. It'll be found by one group in Ethiopia. But it'll be written in a Hebrew, in a Ethiopian dialect called Geds. Then there's another copies that were found at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were only partial scrolls, but they were on Hebrew. But then there was another set of scrolls that were found in Europe, and they were Slavic and Greek. So there's several different kinds of writings, but the one thing that they all had in common was they basically all began the same way. They all gave credit to God and gave credit to a character called Enoch. Now, the Enoch that we're talking about here is a pseudonym. This is not the Enoch that lived back in the earliest generations. He's not the seventh son from Adam, but he uses that name in order to drive across the point of what we're going to be talking about. It's as though he was taking himself back in time and then going forward from there. And so he's looking into the future as he goes by. And so we're watching lots of things. Most scholars today would say that what we're talking about a watcher is being an angel. But there's also other disagreements I fact, the last time I remember reading the book of Genesis in a church, the pastor told me that that these uh, characters called giants came from righteous or actually judges, wealthy men, and that the actual the evil people were actually Cain's kids. And so that was where it came from. But as I'm reading this, I find myself drawn away from that and back to what most Jews early on thought. You see, they originally thought that this was talking about a group of angels. Now, these angels probably got their start in the book of Genesis way back when, and they were there originally assigned for the purposes of helping, teaching, giving vital information to the people. Because you remember, there is no Bible, there is no handy book around, so they gathered their information from the angels. But the angels themselves became polluted, if you will, or changed, and that's where we're going to go to next week. But right now, I just want you to understand that we're talking about the fact that this whole book that we're talking about was here, was lost, has now been found and now is providing plenty of information for scholars to look at. We're going to be looking at lots of different kinds of information as we go through it. Originally, I said the Jews appreciated the book and, and took it in, but it didn't make the canon. And the reason it didn't make the canon was because of the fact that at the same point in time, the Christians were beginning to adopt the book of Enoch. Well, if the Christians are reading it, the Jews can't. And so it became unlawful to read it. In fact, Shimon Bar Yohai, who was one of the great Kabbalists of his day, told everyone that you would go to hell, you would burn in fire if you read the Book of Enoch. And so the Book of Enoch died in the Jewish communities. But at the same time, the Christians began to pick it up. And the reasons they picked it up is because of the Book of Jude. You see, the Book of Jude quotes Enoch. The book of Peter, first and second, both of them speak about 
the times, but they don't quote it directly. The book of Revelations, the four gospels, hint at parts of the book of Enoch. Enoch is a book that has a lot to offer the New Testament. And so with the change of a word here and there, and the word that they change is the word son of man. You see, they, they took the son of man and reapplied it to the Lord or to J.C. But originally that was not who it was for, but it was for those characters like Ezekiel or like Daniel, like Enoch, like Eliyahu, Elijah. Those were the characters who would be assigned the category son of man. As we're going through this, there's there's a whole lot that, that I need to talk to you about. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, and we're going to start at the beginning. So I want you to go to Genesis chapter 5, and we're going to read 18 to 24. Now, that covers all of the section on Enoch. But I want you to understand that there's there's a lot to the story that we really need to look at. If you're there, let's go. And Jared lived 100 or lived 162 years and begot Enoch. Jared lived after he had begotten Enoch 800 years and he had begotten sons and daughters. Now, all the days of Jared were 962 years and then he died. And Enoch lived 65 years, and he begot Metzulah. Now, the word Metzulah, or we call him Methuselah, the interpretation of that word is his death sends. Met is the word for death. His death sends. What does his death send? It sent the flood. So, Keep that in your mind, because as we're going through the book of, of Enoch and we're going through the watcher section, you're going to find out that that is an important understanding. When does the flood come? After the death of Enoch or after the death of Metzulah. Enoch walked with his God after he had begotten Methuselah 300 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was no longer, for God had taken him. 365, an interesting number. We say there's 365 days in a year. In the calendar that Enoch worked with was the Essene calendar, which was a solar calendar. And they believed that the solar calendar should be 364 days. 360 days equal day numbers, two days for the vernal, two days for the, the equinoxes. So it's 364. 365 then speaks of him. After the year, he, he is taken. And notice how it says he walked with God, and after he had begotten Methuselah 300 years, he begot his sons and daughters. And so he walked with God, and then he wasn't. So we have all kinds of discussions about that. Sometimes we simply talk about the fact that God took him. Well, what does it mean that he took him? Did he rip him off the earth? Or did they simply walk off together? And how did that happen? Well, that idea of took is going to be the idea we're going to have to realize when we talk about the fact that the sons of man or sons of God took daughters of men. Took, same word. Does it hold the same meaning? That's part of the things that I, I questioned and dealt with over, over a period of time. The impact of this book on Christianity was tremendous until about the second or third century when some of the scholars began to say that's a Jewish work. Now the Jews gave it up because it was a Christian work and now the Christians are giving it up because the Jews wrote it. So nobody began to read it. So that's why it was never part of the Catholic Bible until later it was added. 
and it was added in the Apocrypha. Apocalyptic literature encapsulates the revelation of supernatural activity transmitted by or to a worthy being who carries the message of the final judgment. So apocalyptic writings speak of final days. That's what we need to remind ourselves of. Enoch is writing towards the final days. And what he's giving us is a roadmap of how to get there. So it comes when the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished. So we're really talking about the very end of days. That's what he's going for. So this is going to be writings that are going to speak to the end. Now, there was a, a, a rabbi named Gershom Shalom, who was probably the, well, in the 20th century, he was the great understander of Kabbalah. He was the great mystic that walked this earth. He, he lived from 1897 all the way to 1982. In fact, he took several books that we're going to talk about, or I'll probably just mention. Among the books that he makes connections with, with the Bible, with the Talmud, with all of the others, is, uh, is the book that we call First and Second Enoch. And I'll tell you a little bit about Enoch, First, Second, and Third in a little bit. And he talks about the apocalypse of Abraham. And he also talks to us about what's called the Maase Merkava, which are the works of the chariot. Because you see, there's two different ways that the Kabbalists work with the writings. One is it works with the chariot, and the other it works with the Heklot, the palace, dealing with the palaces or heaven. So if the writing deals with heaven, it's a it's a Heklot. Maase is the idea of to be to build, to add to. So you're building yourself a chariot. Most of us, when we read the book of Ezekiel, the first chapter, we read it in a in a physical manner. But you see that the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel is a mystical writing. It's how we build a chariot to God. It's how we communicate with God. It's how we draw closer to God. And that's a whole writing in and of itself. But I don't have time. So we'll get, we might go back to that. So we're going to have all of these writings. Now, the book of Enoch itself is really five little booklets. And by five little booklets, I mean, these are, are parchments that have been stitched together. So they did not necessarily have to be written by Enoch. In fact, there's a couple that we are sure weren't written by him that are going to be found in our stories. Now, the first one deals with the Watchers, and I'm going to talk about that last because I'm going to continue in talking about the Watchers. The first one is actually the second book. Now, the second book of, of Enoch is called The Similitudes. The Similitudes. It speaks of parables, and it speaks in parables. That's the thing that you have to understand. So there are a number of parables that he's going to deal with. And it in this whole, the emphasis is on the end of days, and it's emphasizing the blessing for the writ or for the for the blessed and the pain that will come upon those who are found to be the wicked. And he goes through that. This is the portion of the book that is most often taken into Christian understanding because it uses words like, well, Messiah, son of man, the righteous one, the elect one. All of those terms have been used to describe JC, but that's not who it's describing. It's entirely different. And we'll, I'm going to give you that answer later, but I just want you to understand that's what you're going to see. So again, as we're looking at all of these books, we're looking at something that's going to be seen two different ways. One by the Jewish people, one by the Christian people. Somewhere in between is where I stand. And so I'm trying to call the two together and, and make it make sense. So the, the, the second book is just parables dealing with the end. The third book is called the astronomical book. 
it deals with the astronomy. It deals with the sun, the moon, the moon, the stars, talking about how they got there, what they're like, all of the physical features that are there. It talks about the stars. It talks about the calendar, which is probably where the Book of Jubilees draws its information from, or Enoch drew his information from Jubilees, because they're both written at about the same time. So I can't tell you which one came first. But the Book of Jubilees deals with time. Remember, when I was teaching Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12, time was very significant because we were dealing with 70 years or 77s of years or 77s of sevens of years. So as we're going through this, we're, we're going to find that there's a lot of things that it talks about. And so one of the things that's going to emerge from this is the fact that it talks about these men who believe in the this astronomical calendar, which is solar, versus the lunar calendar, which is what Judaism follows today, were probably the Essenes, because the Essenes appear to have left Jerusalem, moved down to Qumran and other places around the, the country of Israel, because of the fact that there were the practices that were going on at the temple were not the practices that should have been going on. The high priest himself was not Jewish. He was more of a Greek. And so therefore we began to see a whole, dis a whole splitting of what was going on. Now the next book in there is called the Book of Dreams. And actually there was only two dreams in the book. So it's a very short book, but the two dreams, first one, Methuselah receives two dreams from God talking with the watchers, understanding what the dreams are. The first one basically is a warning to his sons about the coming deluge. He talks to them about the flood and what's what's going to happen and how it will work. Now, the second one he's going to talk about is called the animal apocalypse. The animal apocalypse. For the longest time, I was wondering if he's talking about the animals who went on the boat. Then I read the section, has nothing to do with that. If you were doing Daniel chapter seven, you remember how Daniel chapter seven talks about the nations that are going to impact Israel, the lion, the bear, the leopard. You remember those, that the, the fourth unusual beast? Well, in the book of Enoch, Enoch begins to describe the nations of the world in the form of animals. And he classifies these nations. Some are kosher, some are non-kosher. So he's giving the people an understanding of what's going to happen in the chapter number 10, 11, and 12 when the nations begin to divide. That's where he's going with his information there. Now, some people say he's talking about something he shouldn't be talking about because he's he's interfering with what's going on in the Temple Mount. Well, remember, if he's really Enoch, there was no Temple Mount. This was back before everything started. So we know he's writing in those days of the second temple, not the first. So he's more in the second and third century BC. So as we, we look at this, we're going to have to see a foundation bedrock of what the Jews should be understanding about their God and about worship. That's what he's talking to and how people should, the good people should react to that. Now, the last book is called the book of Enoch or the epistle of Enoch. And so as that book, that's number five, we have book number one is the watcher. So Book number five is is the, the epistle. And what he does here is he draws upon information that reminds us of righteousness and wickedness. And he spends a lot of time differentiating the groups, talking about what makes one righteous, what makes one of the other. He comes up with the finally what's called the apocalypse of weeks, which seems to be very similar to what Daniel was talking about. Not the same, but very similar to that. Finally, the book that we started with is the, is the book called The Watchers. 
and that's where I want to spend part of my focus. I've already gone a half hour, so I may not get through with all of this, but that's okay because I wasn't planning on being through with the story of the Nephilim tonight anyway. I think it's more important for you to understand the background of where this man is writing from. That's what I think is the most important. Once you have a, a background, an understanding, when I start talking to you and I pull back and, and go back to these places, it won't be foreign to you. Now, some of you have copies of my, of my notes. So you have an opportunity to read my notes over and over again. And if anybody is interested in them, just send word to Native or and it'll get word to me and I will send you copies. I'm there's no sense hoarding what I know. It's uh, I, I spread ignorance easily. So I just want you to understand what's going on. And understand this is Native. This is a network that's built or designed to educate us. It's not here for socialization, it is here for education. And so I'm a teacher. That's what I was by trade. I am not a rabbi, but I spent my whole life teaching. And my favorite subject in teaching was history. It was the geography. It was all of those things that most people wanted to get through and, and turn off. But I find it fascinating because it lives out today, what's going on in those days past. So anyway, we're going to deal with a hero. So our hero is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. So I want you to grab your Bible again, and I want you to go to Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 5. And we're going to look at that more closely, because we've got to know those what's going on here before we can really go anywhere else. Aren't you glad you got a Bible? Now, it may not be in mine, but that's okay. As long as it has God's word in it, you can read it out of a paperback. So in chapter six, it begins the following. And it came to pass when man began to increase upon the ground and daughters were born to them. So notice when man, when Adams, the word that man is Adam. So when the Adams were born, daughters were born. And so these well, let me read the verse again. And it came to pass when Adam began to increase upon the ground and daughters were born to them, the multiple Adams, the sons of the rulers is how my book talks about it, saw the daughters of man were good and they took themselves wives from whomever. Now, the sons of rulers is, is one of those phrases that my Bible uses, but it gives me a, an understanding that we're not really talking about just the sons of the rulers. Some, again, the Jewish people do not accept this book because it was accepted by the Christians. And so their understanding was that these sons of men or these rulers are actually princes and Jews and, and judges. That's how they interpret it. But if you really are going back to it, and we'll get further into it, they're really angels that he's talking about. Those are the watchers that came down with Daniel. So that's where we're at at this particular point in time. So in our story, then, it goes on to say, My spirit shall not contend evermore concerning man, since he is but flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now, if you're reading the book of Jubilees, 120 years takes us from the days of man, which was Seth. We would go 120 Jubilee cycles, and you end up on October 6th, 2023. Isn't that amazing? Now, in the literal terms, you could say that they lived 120 years. But when you looked at the generations before the flood, they were living eight, nine, almost a thousand years. And when you look at them after the flood, they're still living hundreds of years. Now, some people say, well, that, that, that 120, that talks about Moses. Moses lived 120 years. Well, it could have. But I find it fascinating that he uses the term man, and Seth was the first man, 
that was created after Ad after Cain and Abel. And he is the progenitor of a lot of these people. So anyway, as I go on, verse four says, the Nephilim, the Nephilim, Nephil, which is a singular, Nephilim is plural. The idea of Neph Nephilim is the idea of fallen ones, one who falls, one who does not hold his place. That's what's going on here. And as you're looking at it, then he begins by saying, uh, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And afterwards, when the sons of the rulers, these others, would consort with the daughters of men who would bear to them, they were mighty who were from old, were men of devastation. It requires you to go back and look through the Talmud and some of the Midrashic writings in order to really get an understanding of what he's talking about. First off, if I don't have to honor the Jewish people and say that I can read this book and I won't go to hell, my understanding is that the angels came down. Do you remember reading, when, if you were a Christian, the book of Jude? Book of Jude has one chapter, but the book of Jude spends three verses talking about Enoch. Daughters of men, sons of God, that's who they talk about. Well, if the sons of God came down, they left their first estate, according to Jude. In other words, they divested themselves of their angelic being and became human. And in becoming human, they could now intermarry with humans. So you have angels who came down, and the angels having come down having taken off their cloaks, have become human. They took wives, not that they stole them, just as Abraham took his wife, Sarah, just as Isaac took his wife, Rebekah, just as Jacob took his wives, the word is took. So the angels didn't beat up anybody to get these women. But they decided that they were going to marry them. Now, in the process of marriage, as we're going through this, I want you to notice the fact that these characters now are going to produce the Nephilim that it talks about in the beginning of the verse. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. How'd they get there? They were birthed on the earth. It was when the angels procreated with the women that we created this new beast. Now, if you're speaking Greek, the word for Nephilim is Cyclops, one-eyed. Goes back to Homer and the Odyssey. I don't know if you've gone through the, your Greek literature, just to give you some understanding. It's also the idea of there were giants. And there's going to be giants in the land when we, we get into the J Joshua all the way up through David. But these Nephilim were fallen. Now, when I read you the story of Enoch's life, I read you from his father. And you remember his father's name? It was Yared, Jared. At the time, I didn't realize what I was naming my kid. But, his, but the name Yared is to descend. What descended during the days of Jared, the sons of God. They landed on, according to the writings in the book of Enoch, on Mount Hermon, the tallest mountain. And from there, they began to spread out. And so we begin to see a, an inkling of what's going on that's in the book for you to read, because I'm not going to read it all to you. But the understanding is this is important to know. This is important to know before we get started. How did we create Nephilim? I believe from the sons of God who were angels divesting themselves of their angelic spirit and becoming physically human. Now, there's a lot of consternation about size. 
And I can only tell you that it really poses a problem. There are bones that were discovered, and I can't remember where Ross was talking about it earlier, the bones of Noah's wife, Naama. Naama, according to her skeletal structure, if that is her, she was 18 feet tall. 18 feet. She was from the line of Cain. Noah, obviously, was from the line of Seth. Was Seth short or was Seth just as tall? We don't know. That part's not told to us in any scriptures that I can find. But 18 feet is rather tall. But yet we call the Nephilim, when it's all said and done, giants. How much bigger were they than Naama? Some estimates were as tall as four stories of a building. Some were even taller. They were huge and had a tremendous appetite. And so that leads us to another set of stories. Now, remember, they divested themselves of their spiritual nature, but they did not divest their mind of what they knew. And so what was happening on the earth during the days of Noah was the earth was becoming more and more corrupt. That's when God said, I can't take any more. Now, what caused him to do that? Three things are pointed out in the book of, of Enoch. One, weapons. You see, before the angels came down, there were no weapons. Nobody made anything out of metal. In fact, ladies, there was no jewelry. Metal was not used. Not only that, ladies, there was no eyeshadow. There was none of the cosmetics that we use today, but there were when the giants came to be. We began to see the fact that they have weapons for war. They also have items for seduction. They began to change how people looked at one another. The final straw comes, if you happen to read the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, when you learn about all the possibilities of sorcery. You see, they brought with them understandings of the stars and how you can read the stars and all of the, the understandings of horoscopes. They understood how to read dried bones. They learned how to do all kinds of sorcery. All of that was a part of their story. Imagine that. Righteous Enoch enters into the story by agreeing to petition God on behalf of these angels that had lost their first estate. Now, they lost their first estate, and I'll go back through it next time. They lost their first estate because they wanted to cohabit with these women but they knew ahead of time if they did their life expectancy and their end result were not to their favor they would end up in a place that was lower than hell dark 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 totally heated in other words they were in the midst of a black fire with the inability to see anyone or anything. Now, according to the book of Enoch, they're still there, still buried, still covered, still there screaming. I remember hearing the stories of, of people who have gone out in the desert or the in the wilderness trip where they've heard sounds from holes in the ground of screaming and weeping. Some say that's them. But according to Jewish understanding, that's only Gehenna. This is lower than that. In fact, they call it Tartardus, place of darkness. So we go through this whole idea. Now, according to one of the people I was reading, 
her name was Anita Yoshiko Reed. She explains the fact that the nature of the giants contaminated by mingling with the spirit and the flesh of a human. And upon the expiration of their physical bodies, their spirits roamed the earth. Hello. Their spirits roamed the earth. In other words, their evil did not dissipate from this earth. They simply continued in the form of demons, which is going to be recorded in the second book of Enoch. It goes on to say, at, after that, it says, the spirits roam, or what would be known biblically as the idea of evil spirits roaming the earth as demons, carrying on in corruption and corrupting humankind by whispering in their ears, talking to their minds. Rebellion. Now, scholars are going to point out the focus of this whole thing should be on the origin of sin. It's not, although sin becomes very important because we find out why it increased so fast and why today sin has multiplied in such a hurry. Enoch influenced a lot of books in the New Testament. And like I said, it influenced the book of Jude. I want to read a portion of the book of Jude for you and show you the difference between the way the Jewish writing is and the way it is written in Christian Bibles. In the uh, Jewish Bible. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, Tartarus, bound with everlasting chains of judgment on their, on their great day. Now he goes on to say in the book of Jude, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them, seeing the Lord is coming with thousands of, upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. Remember how I read that in the first eight verses of the book of First Enoch? Only there it called it millions. He goes on to say in this text, and to convict all of them of the ungodly, all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, Jude, again, behold, he will arrive with 10 million of his saints. That's according to Enoch. But when you read it in the Hebrew, in the New Testament, you're going to find out the word he isn't there, but the word the Lord is. Helping them to understand that this is about Jesus. It's not. He goes on to say in several other places as, as I pick it up. Enoch's book can be found, I've already said, in the book of Jubilees. It can also be found in the book of Baruch, which is Jeremiah's uh, second writer. He's his ghost writer, remember. It's also written by in during the Second Temple period, and it speaks in the book of Esdras. Esdras is, again, the idea of uh, Ezra, the, the priest Ezra. And the Jewish apocalypse that was in that time, the assumption of the Moses, which is also written at that time, and the tale of the 12 patriarchs, which is in Enoch's book. Lots of things are going to be found in here. Lots of things that are going to be told, and I'll have to spend time as we go along talking you through some of the stories that we're going to get to. But again, Gershom Sholem said this is the premier book behind the, the uh, Sefer Yetzirah as a book that begins the real study of Kabbalah. That's where this is all beginning. And it deals with the Merkava, the works of the chariot, the works of going towards God. That's what this whole book is about. We want to move towards God. We want to keep in mind our righteousness will help us in the end. Evil will not get us anywhere but it will take us somewhere. 
So we've got all of these things written so far. So the mainstream church has changed its mind about the book, and so has everyone else. Now, as we're going through this, there's going to actually be three, two more books of Enoch. Enoch has written three books. No, he didn't. One was written in the second century BCE. One was written at the temple period. And one was written 300 years later. But all of them are going to cover basic premises of what the Christian church has adopted and accepted. All of them are going to lead us in a, in a direction. The book of Enoch is going to lead us through the idea of demons. It's going to be the first book that we're going to find that actually calls them demons that we're going to deal with. And so we're, we're going to see things that are there that we haven't seen before. So it's going to take me a while to, to get you to understand some of the things that are happening. The book of Mark talks about clean or unclean, talks about pure or impure spirits. Well, those are demonic spirits. In the book of Enoch, in chapter 10, 13 to 15, he writes, and those days they shall be led off to the fire or to the abyss of fire and to the torment and to the prison in which they shall be confined forever and destroy all the spirits of the reprobate and the children of the washers because of the harm that they have caused human beings at that point in time. I want to stop right now. I've only got three pages left of my notes to read, but I, I want to stop because if I go too far, as Lori has already told me, I've, I've taught more than seven new things to you people, enough to keep you busy for a couple hours if you want to go through my notes or if you want to go backtrack and look, look online. Um, there are several good YouTube videos that I would recommend. That you, there are a lot of junk ones. Uh, I have been re reading and watching for close to two days now, so I'm tired of looking at them. But th there are some good ones, and I'll recommend you some. Um, right now, they're not in my head. They fell out somewhere. They're, uh, Marshall Taylor was one of them. Marshall Taylor has three good videos. One deals with the 10 main points of the book, first book of Enoch. That one is it's only 19, 19 minutes. It's an easy read or easy listen. But again, it's a very Christianized version of it, but he covers 10 important facts. So that's where you can go with that. The other fellow was six foot seven and I can't think of his name. But anyway, questions, thoughts, um, anything that I can give you for help as you're going through this. Mary, you got a idea, thought? Uh, I, I wanted to, you to go through something again quickly. Um, you said something about 120 days. Oh, from, that's the book of Genesis. Yeah, but 120 days, is that, um, what days? Okay. All right, go back. You got Genesis chapter six open up to you. Yep. Okay, so we're, and it's 120 years, actually, is what it says. And so you're looking at verse number three. All right. And Hashem said, my spirit shall not contend evermore concerning those, those speaking of the sinful ones. And what it goes on to say after that, or let's see, or, or more concerning man, since he is but flesh. His days shall be 120 years. His days shall be 120 years. As I was suggesting, the Book of Jubilees deals with the same 120 years. In the Book of Jubilees, it starts with the character called man, which was Seth. Mm -hmm. Seth was the first man, if you go through the understandings. From Seth until October 6th, well, let's see, from Seth's 13th birthday, and I have to use the 13th birthday because he has to become a man. Okay. So man does not become a man until he's reached his bar mitzvah age. So from that year to 120 years cycles, which is what, 3,430 years. We're talking about 
120 jubilees? Yes. Okay, that's what I, yeah. That takes you all the way out to October 6, 2023. That's 120 jubilee years. Okay. Okay, that clears it up. Thank you. Yeah. Steve? Well, it wasn't very clear for a long. Yeah. Somebody talking. Kevin, you talking? Yes. I have okay. some wild ideas, and I need someone like you to clarify me. So be prepared for, for some wild ideas, okay? Okay. The Bible says we entertain angels. Can we entertain demons? Can there be a demon that just looks like human? Could that be possible? Yes. Okay. So if we go to generation curses, that if we go to the last name of people and it goes to the generation curses, could we know that there's demons by the generation curses? So you can't judge it. But could we just know by the last name what generation curses? Could there be a line of generation curses? Someone well, can stop it. I, I, I'm going to stop you for a second. I'll give you my opinion, and Rod might want to th throw in a, a, a better one. But right now, my understanding is that each generation is a new generation. Okay. You, in, you inherit the chromosomes from your father and your mother. Okay. You can, You don't inherit demonic spirits okay thank you for clarifying yes so thank you you, you you get those on your own you you earn those stripes okay, this, the you. idea behind them is the fact that um they're looking for a dry place okay is it what the book of matthew says okay that it, you know you clean out your house and then tend to, it's seven times worse when they come back in in other words the idea is as uh, same as I, uh, as Enoch says, you must work on getting better. Thank we you. all are working towards God. That that concept I don't want to lose track of. Everybody should end working towards getting towards God. Thank you I for have, clarifying. I think you answered my question. I think so. I just need someone to balance my ideas. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Rod, do you have anything to add? Uh, if I did, it would be useless because you really did a, a brilliant job answering that. I appreciate that. Okay, very, thank you. Very good. Uh, Ross typed something up, I think. Oh, there he is. He disappeared for the longest time. What you, what you saying? As soon as he unhooks. You're mute, muted my friend i was saying that you have covered so much here there's a <laughs> ton to unpack and i mean you could go on for the next two hours i've got well, i i would agree with Lori. you should spend a bit more time on the introduction before you head out and i think you can gauge it because i i'm unpacking this and What's interesting for me, I don't know about anybody else, but while you're talking, I'm connecting dots going, oh, oh, yeah, yes, that's right. This is it. It's it's amazing. I'll, I'll be oh, quiet. No, you're fine. And, and the reason I the reason I go so far is for people like you. You and Ross know your scriptures. I'm I'm talking to a choir. For the other people, everything is new. So I will have to spend time going back through what I'm teaching now. I can't, as you can understand, I have three pages left, four pages left of notes. I'm on page eight of my notes. So I've got to go back and bring back some of this again. So instead of this being part one, it'll be part one A, then I'll give you part one B, and then I'll give you two, because it, there's there's a lot of information here. I understand. I I'm so excited to teach it. That's the the fun thing is I'm I'm excited to share what I'm learning with other people. We're, um, we're also excited because you're excited. That that that's what makes it makes it the best. Uh, Ross, do you have something? Yes, uh, one question and one observation. Okay. 
the question is you you referred to they call the place tar Tartardus. 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 Yes. Reminds me a lot of a Tartaria, which is it, it, that is also a place of the same ilk. Yes. Tartardus is is the let's see, Tartara is a singular plot of ground. Tartardus is the the world, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So Tartara is, is would be a like would be compared to a nation. Or Tartardus would be compared to the world. In other words, it's the the total number of graves that are there. Okay. So, and the observation is, um, at the point where you said that only the chosen would be accepted, or something. I'm not entirely sure, but you use the term chosen. Yeah, that beca that's because that's the term used by Enoch. Correct. But there was a word that goes before it, which is, um, I've got to go back through my notes and find where I said it. It okay. talks about not only the chosen, but the peaceful ones. In other words, there are two groups. The chosen obviously would lead me to Israel. Then I'd have to ask myself the question, who are the peaceful ones? That's us. Right. That's us. So even Enoch understood way back when that that there are two groups of people. If, if there's nothing else, you have the clean and the unclean, but you also have also the clean Jew and the unclean Jew. You also have the clean peaceful one and the unclean ruthless one, I guess, is what exactly. you would Exactly, right. which is my observation was going to be that his his use of the term chosen here would simply only imply the righteous. Simply because if the wicked are punished, only the righteous would be left, so those would be the chosen, whether you're Jew or not. I right. can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was just just a, I, I think that's kind of it's it, and for my way of thinking that I, I can see how that would because if you say chosen, you really have to come down to a very fine point. Otherwise, well, again, he's writing in the second century BCE. Mm -hmm. In the second century BCE, there is no Christian; it's only Judaism and the other. So how do you define the other? And I think he uses the word the peaceful one. Right. I can't I can't find it, but I'll I'm gonna to have to go back through my notes anyway and, and rewrite and then pick it up again. Because I have a lot more to say about the New Testament. I have a lot more to say about heaven, the ten heavens, and uh talking about second Enoch and third Enoch. And there's just a lot of information that we can really understand Christianity right. is Jewish even if they don't want to think about it as such yep the, the terminology came out of Judaism they may have changed it from Hebrew to uh, Latin or Greek but it came out of Judaism so it's tough to just separate it out and, and lump us all together again because Enoch didn't he he just simply tried to choose the idea of the peaceful ones and they chose the idea. Hey, but again, you, hey Ross, huh? put your hand down. It's somebody else's turn. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say you'd have cracked up, Steve, when I first started reading this article because I thought it said, I, Enoch, and that went on and on. And I went, whoa. I should have left a number one there already. instead of an I. I have so the a problem point being, with Roman numerals. The point being, I don't have the number of dots that Ross and Rod have. <laughs> so, yeah, I got a little deeper into it than I understood. Oh, it's for, okay. <sighs> chapter one or book one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, are you kidding? I'm just showing you uh, exactly what kindergarten this is sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the lesson the lesson was not supposed to be simple, but at the same time, it was supposed to be an introduction. Hey, so I'm going to have to go back and, and bring some of it back up again next time. Steve. It was fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for making it simple. Kevin, go ahead. Thank you for making it simple. That was so simple for me. I like simple. <laughs> that was so simple for me. I like simple. I don't like complex. You may think it was complicated, but I understood everything. Thank you for making it so so simple. I well, will uh, I will ditto that, Steve. Spot on. If I, I took out all the it, all the big words. If I could understand it, anybody can. Great uh, job. Great no job. No offense, man. but you've got you've got a background that is better than mine, I'm sure. No, no, no. My goodness, I am so pleased. That's why I was smiling through this whole thing because I saw these connections and thank you. Thank you. I, I'm very looking welcome. forward to the next step. Uh, unfolding and i agree okay. with lori take your time let's get through the introduction okay i you know i just have this problem with being patient ask my wife yeah so anyway <laughs> we heard her <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you all for being with me i hope to see you again next week oh ross got something just one more question all right just just, I want to make sure I got my dots connected correctly. Okay. The watchers were supposed to only watch. But yes, they, and, and advise. And advise. But they took it upon themselves to come down here and begin to uh, intermingle with the humans. Right. So, in essence, it makes the watch those watchers that took it upon themselves to do so be had uh, now would be deemed the fallen angels. Well, no, the fallen angels are the children that were created. Mm. The Nephilim themselves are the are the children. It's like a horse and a mule having a child. Okay, but it only goes one generation. Well, the Watchers were kind of similar to what you would call angels. Yes, they were They were a, a group of angels. I would also compare them to the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece. Correct. In other words, they had authority. Right. Yeah. And this is where we get the concept of Satan, the, the ones who took it upon themselves to come down and start yeah. to wreak havoc. So these fallen angels, if you will, that have introduced war and destruction and makeup and so on and so forth, also was responsible for generating or be, becoming the progenitors of a class of individuals that would display these traits. Division, right. division, hate, war, government, so on and so forth. Sin. Right, sin. So, all right, I've got my dots connected. That works okay. out fine. Thank you. Well, now you can take this question home with you. If Nephilim cannot reproduce, they die after 500 years. How do you get the Nephilim on the other side of the flood? <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to leave you with something easy. Well, Lori, I, I you got I a question. Explained that. I explained that earlier. Well, Lori, what are you thinking? Well, I was thinking about a lesson many months ago where you talked about the fact that the angels were discussing with each other the fact that. Man, if we could get down to earth, we could certainly improve upon how these people act. What in the world are you thinking? So are those the same people that are, the, I mean, the same angels that are called watchers now? Okay. Great question. And the answer is maybe. <laughs> and the reason I say maybe is because those angels one was called Azaz, and one was called Azel. The 
remember the goat sacrifices at the temple, the Azazel? Yes. That yes. was for one of these angels. Now, according to the stories of Enoch, our character, main character is Shemhazi. Doesn't match with either of them. So, no. Okay, so now I'm asking Ross the question, could they have been angels on both sides? Could more have dissipated? Also in the book of First Enoch, 20 of them are listed as leaders of these angels watchers and 180 angels followed them which is where we start getting the story in the book of revelations where a third of the stars fell from the sky that comes from here in in, in enoch if you will and the leader of the group that's in the one third category his name was santan ale Satan, Satan L, the God called Satan. So you've got several groups that I haven't yet placed into a category. So my answer is, I haven't the faintest idea. So I'm 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 still learning. You understand? You you don't. By next year, I will be back, and I will tell you that I've learned more and it's just what you do. If you continue to study, you're going to find yourself frustrated because you didn't get it all the first time. Now that probably doesn't happen to Ross and to Rod, but it does to me all the time. Oh no. <laughs> just, just like I said, you know, Rod wanted me to teach something. And I said, well, what am I going to teach? I'd already gone through Daniel. That's really the only prophetic book that you really I can do Ezekiel or some of those other, but that's not the point. So I, I didn't want to do those, but I did want to learn more about the Nephilim. So you folks are subjects to my whims. And so this is what I whimmed. We're going to learn about the Nephilim. We're going to learn about how they got from one side of the flood to the other. Where did they come from? How did they get there? What are the little words that we don't see that are actually going to tell us the, the difference? So, yeah, they came on a boat. Yeah. You, you, know, for you, you. know, Steve, the, yeah. the interesting thing is this theme exists in every ancient culture across the world that what you would thought was separated by space and geography, and yet there are all similar similar in every way it's like how do you answer that without understanding this is what i'm saying correct correct i'm, I'm good stories yep well i'm glad you stayed with me long enough you acted like you would have stayed even longer if i'd have had something else else to say i do have three pages but i'm not going to do that so anyway Ancient alien TV show proved that. Okay, oh, Lori. Interesting. Good. Yeah. So she just once again, she's smarter than us. So um, I didn't know that. So she's smarter than the average bear. Let's put it that way. Oh. Yogi told me but told yeah. me about that a don't, long time ago. Don't be fooled by her questions. I she won't. tries to act like, oh, I don't know. So yep. innocent, and she's just leading you right into the bear <laughs> trap. Okay. Yep. You, you got That's... to crack me up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there, there are two yogis that I admire the most. One is Yogi Bear, and the other one is Yogi Berra. They both have yeah. lots of good things to say. Well, and if I sure. can remember them all, I'd be all right. But <laughs> I'm not. But See? anyway. Yes. This is Jeff. I want you to go back to your board. Go back to my what? board that you used to draw on for us for Sunday school class. <laughs> no, there's there's plenty of time. Better. <laughs> well, um, well, may somebody teach her or show her how to put her name up because we would love to know who this person is. Well, so she's right up there. <laughs> she do does. What? They they do have it on Sundays, but it's not showing tonight. I don't know what happened with her phone. Oh, okay. 
She's so anyway. in incognito mode. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate yeah. it. Enjoy yourself tonight. I am going to relax for a couple minutes before I get started on my last chapters of Jeremiah. So, hey, shalom, y'all. Hasta la bagels. Hasta la bagels.